Chris, this is your first time with us, right? It is. Oh, it is. yeah, we got. I made sure I'm, I'm, you I'm a newbie. newbie. Yeah, he's yeah. a, a newbie. But you're the but you're the guy who brought all this together. Chris doesn't know that the first bit of this is me just talking to Chris <laughs> for a couple of minutes, so you could get a chance yes. to meet him. And the, here's the thing: we wouldn't be here at all if it weren't for Chris Gill and a few others who came together back in 2013 to pull together modern Stoicism. This is this is true. This is true. It was a very good idea. And uh, it's grown beyond all our expectations. Yeah, it's just, it is a fantastic thing. I think that we're, I mean, the thing is, I get the chance to chat with a lot of people now because we've been doing these events every month and we get to have the conversation here inside this room. And it's like, this is, uh, there are people out here who are hungry for finding a path through the world. And I think modern stoicism is one of those paths that people seem to like and enjoy, and it seems yeah. to work for them. Yeah. Yes. That's the wonderful thing. And, and yeah. And thanks to you, Phil, for setting up these conversations. It was your idea and they, they seem to be working wonderfully well. So thanks for that. So, so far so good. Right. Um, okay. Here's the thing, Chris, we, what we do here is we're going to um, give you the platform and we're going to, um, you know, we get you to do 10 or 15 minutes, whatever makes sense for you, 10 or 15 minutes of presentation. You can share screen, whatever you want to do. And then um, I'll come back up and we'll do some Q&A a little bit with you and me. If people have questions, they can stick them down inside the chat. And then you've got a couple of questions already prepared, which I will share with the group inside the chat here so they can take it with them when they go into breakout rooms. But basically, we're going to start here and then we're going to go into small rooms and have some conversations based on some of the stuff that you're going to talk to us about today. Does that sound right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. To me, right. anyway. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it, it is in fact right. Right. So this, yeah. Is the, <laughs> yeah, this is the way we're going to do it. So what I'm going to do first is I am going to introduce you and then I'm going to slide off into the audience. How about that? So I have, because, you know, you're such an accomplished cat, I've got a lot to read about you. So just lean back, Chris. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce today's distinguished speaker, Chris Gill. Chris is an emeritus professor of ancient thought at the University of Exeter, where he taught for many years before retiring at the end of 2013. His research is focused on ancient Greek and Roman philosophy, especially ethics and psychology. Chris is the author of several acclaimed books examining ancient conceptions of self and personality, including the structured self in Hellenistic and Roman thought and personality in Greek epic tragedy and philosophy, the self dialogue for which he was awarded, I hope I get this right, a Runciman Prize in 1997. All right. More recently, Chris has published a major commentary on the first six books of Marcus Aurelius' Meditations, providing new insights into the Stoic foundations of this important text. He has also co-edited volumes interpreting the work of the Roman physician Galen. Chris remains actively engaged in research and public outreach, focused on the relevance of ancient Stoic ethics and Galenic medicine to modern times. He frequently gives invited lectures internationally on these topics. His latest book is Learning to Live Naturally, Stoic Ethics and Modern Significance, 2022, and he is working on an introductory book on Stoic ethics in collaboration with our very own Brittany Polat. And that book is in production. Do you have a date on that, Chris? Do you know when that'll be? No, not yet. No. Okay. All right. In short, Chris is a leading scholar who has greatly advanced our understanding of ancient Stoic and Platonic thought. And he is a founding member of the Modern Stoicism team, of which I'm a very small part. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Chris Gill to the stage. Thank you, Chris. Okay. Th thanks for your kind words. Uh, Phil, and thanks to everyone for coming on a Saturday morning, afternoon, um, and I hope we're going to have a terrific discussion. The world needs some quiet, reflective, thoughtful discussions uh, about important, about how to tackle important questions, and that, that's what we hope, what I hope we can make progress with today. So, um, uh, what I want to do is to take some ideas from Cicero's On Duties, 
And Cicero wasn't a Stoic, but he was very influenced by Stoicism. And he presents Stoic ideas about making choices, making decisions in his work on duties. There we are, <laughs> a rather plain schoolmasterly kind of handout, but that's what you get <laughs> with me. Okay, so Sto Cicero's on duties, the Stoic blueprint for ethical choices. So um, what do people, what are the key factors in making choices? Well, what do people generally base their, cho base their choices on? The first factor is we aim to bring about objectives that are often valued by people, health, prosperity, a stable family life, other people's respects. And Cicero calls these advantages, in stoic terms, technical term, their preferred indifference. The second factor is we aim to carry out activities which are generally seen as appropriate, given that we want to bring about these objectives. Uh, taking care of our health, earning a living, looking after our parents, our partner, our children. And Cicero calls these duties or obligations. In Stoic terms, they're appropriate actions. Now, these, these are general factors in all decision-making. This is a, a general, typical idea. And the Stoics also recognize the significance of these factors. But they also offer a broad framework to give coherence to the specific decisions that make up our life and help us deal with competing factors and cases of moral conflict. So their, their key theme is that we should make decisions which incorporate the first two factors in line with the virtues and with human nature at its best. The virtues, the Stoics analyze the virtues into four cardinal virtues. These are generic virtues and they have many subdivisions and they map the main sectors of human experience. Cicero presents these virtues in a twofold way. He gives the standard Stoic definition and he gives a more actively benevolent version. So wisdom, he defines as good judgment in determining the right thing to do. Uh, that's the standard definition. And then the benevolent version is using good judgment to benefit others, other individuals in your community. The second virtue is courage, which Cicero calls magnanimity. Uh, the standard view in Stoic view is that this involves facing danger and challenge for a worthwhile aim. Uh, and secondly, doing so to benefit other people significantly. The third cardinal virtue is justice, standardly giving other people or communities what is due. And the beneficial version is, the benevolent version is generosity, taking the initiative in providing benefits for others. And temperance or moderation, which Cicero calls fittingness, decorum, is standardly moderating emotions and desires and treating other people with respect and consideration. That's the more socially related one. So here are the four virtues. So here are the, uh, is one very key factor in making decisions, is trying to act according to the virtues, trying to get an understanding of the virtues, trying to work out what they mean, and then trying to apply them in our decisions, applying them in conjunction with the other two factors. The Stoics believe in what they call the unity of the virtues. They think that to apply any one virtue properly, we need to apply the others too, though one virtue may be most relevant for the situation in hand. So it's a matter of bringing together, bringing together the virtues. Um, and the Stoics are the great exponents of bringing things together, of joined up thinking. So that's one hugely important factor in Stoic decision-making, Stoic choices. We should also line, also act, uh, aim to act, the Stoics think, in line with human nature at its best. The Stoics have a series of important beliefs about human nature at its best that are relevant to this. They believe that human beings are distinctively rational and sociable, 
both rational and sociable. They believe we are capable of applying rationality in all aspects of our life, including making choices, having emotions, and caring for others properly. We're fundamentally sociable and inclined to form relationships and engage in communities in a rational way. Stoics also believe that we're all capable of developing the virtues and that doing so fulfills our nature as human beings. And because of these shared characteristics, human beings as a whole make up a kind of broad community. And we have obligations towards this community, this broad community, the, the community of humankind, as well as towards our immediate uh, friends and family. Now, let's see if I can get this line to go down. Sorry, I haven't. Oh, and is this, this, no. Ah, oh, there we are. <laughs> I don't have Phil's facility at technical things. Here we are. Um, these two ideals, virtues and human nature, they're not just distinct aims. They're not on the same level as the first and second factors. This is actually something that's quite difficult to get hold of in this uh, theory. They're not, they're, not, they're not distinct aims. They give you a framework. So within this framework, acting virtuously, acting as a good human being, you can also consider uh, the first two factors. You, you can consider advantages and you can um, consider your, your duties, your appropriate things. So it's a matter of, of combining, weaving these things together. So the, the, what, the virtue, what the Stokes trying to do is to give you a broad framework to, and making them part of a coherent and um, and well-directed life. Now, how do we set about putting this framework into practice? Well, that's going to be our topic for the whole morning or afternoon, but I want to mention one more very useful idea that we can weave in here. This is the uh, idea which Cicero puts forward in On Duties, book one, the theory of the four roles. Um, Cicero, following the Stoics, thinks that we have all have four roles and we should work towards consistency between them. So role A is our common human role, acting in line with the virtues and with the human characteristics of rationality and sociability. That's common to all of us, should be common to all of us. Role B is our individual talents and natural inclinations, our character. So we all, we're all, we all have common human characteristics, but we express them in distinct ways, distinctive ways. Role C is the specific social context we find ourselves in and its duties and obligations to our family, for instance. So we, we, we aren't in some kind of moral vacuum. We're, 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 in, a, we're in a specific context, and that's the, the situation we make our decisions in. And role D is our main overall project, our mission, our chosen area for living, what we think of as what we want to do, raising a family, having a public and political role, having a certain kind of career, having a bit. So, so all the four factors and the aim, the Stoic idea is, to, again, to bring these together. Consistency. What we're working towards is consistency. Equanimity, uh, Cicero calls that. So that's the sort of starting point for our initial, um, our initial uh, discussion, which will take place in a minute. But that's all I'm going to put forward now i think um what i'd like to do now is pause and have some q a on what i've said so far chris i think this is a um, important thing and a hard thing right i mean you know as a as someone who's trying to practice philosophical stoicism we're trying to figure out how to do the right thing and what do these you know what do these um 
what how do these virtues play out for us right and i guess this is what sister is kind of expanding upon right it's like let's take these and make them a little further and i don't think we normally see that when people are talking about the virtues yeah so sorry what 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 what, what is that is your question so cicero is expanding upon this why is he doing it how do we get to use that for us right okay so um what he does what, C what cicero actually does he gives lots of examples he gives lots and lots of examples so he he'll say well this is the kind of thing i mean by wisdom this is the kind of thing i mean by courage and magnanimity so he gives lots of examples so um so we, so that's that's how he does it. Now I'm not going to give. I mean, it would take you know it would take a long time to give lots of examples. But 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 in other words, he doesn't think Cicero doesn't think that just giving these words, you know, the, the names of these virtues will in itself, as it were, make you virtuous. These are these are kind of giving you a framework. I think uh, one important thing here is is to think well, what's the alternative? Okay, because you might say, oh well, forget about the virtues. We'll just go for advantages, you know. I, I, I need to look, you know, I need to look after my family, or I need to make money, or I need to, you know, do whatever it might be. Now, but 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 then, you need you need you need a framework in which to, do, or at least it's good to have an ethical framework in which to do that. So if you can think of, okay, I'm going to help my family, but I'm going to do it in a, in a way that that is wise, courageous, just. And so on. That that then you then you're now putting together different kinds of factors and making uh, making a, a coherent frame a coherent uh, combination. Is that helpful or not? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that's the thing, right? We know if we've been at this for any length of time, right? We think wisdom, courage, temperance, justice, right? But how do we blend those? How do those get practically applied? What do those actually mean in a situation, right? I mean, and how do I balance off um, courage and justice? How do I make those both work together? Okay. Um, well, just answering that question, I mean, there's, there's two questions, aren't there? What, what is involved in putting it into practice? Yeah. Um, and that's that's partly why the four persona theory, the four roles theory, can be helpful because it localizes it. I mean, it it, it tries to connect it with with our specific situation, um, all of which is is different. But say, because you might say, oh well, we don't need <laughs> we don't need to be, do things in in consistency with all the virtues. We can just have one of the virtues, but that won't work. You know, supposing you take courage, I just need you might you might say, oh well, I just need to be a, a brave, courageous person, and then and then if you ask the question, well, hang on, D don't you make any judgments about what is worth risking? Supposing you are risking your life for what is worth right. engaging in danger, uh, and then and then you say, well, hang no, there's got to be a there's got to be a, a larger uh, framework of understanding about what is worth risking your life for. And then could you possibly be courageous without being just? You know, that is without considering what is fair to each of the parties involved. No, of course you can't. So it's not just thinking in terms of the virtues, it's thinking about how the virtues fit together. That's that's crucial. And I think that is an initial kind of constraint on, on our actions. If you, if you can't match them with all of the four virtues, then there's something something wrong. There's something gone wrong. Like right. you know, say moderation. You say, oh, well, I'm going to be, you know, I'm going to go on a diet, and I'm going to be really moderate in in respect to what I eat or drink. Uh, but then you don't think about, you don't have any kind of judgment about what kind of life you're trying to lead, about what imp what implications this this might have for your your treatment of other people. So I think just trying to fit the factors together, fit the virtues together, is in itself a kind of a kind of help, a help, even though even before you correlated them or tried to correlate them with specific actions. Right. Uh, let's see. I want to see if I can pull something in here. Uh, questions out of but, the chat. Yeah. Go ahead. I mean, one reason I'm not. You might say, well, why are the rules? I want more rules. But you, Stoicism isn't great on rules. It's not a rule based. <laughs> it's not a rule based right. ethic. There aren't ten right. commandments here. I mean, you know, it's it's 
That that isn't the way it works. The rules, the, the, the rules of thumb, as it were, emerge in the process of making good decisions or trying to make them good decisions. Yeah. Oh, that's, I, another I, thing. that's another thing that's it, often people often think, oh well, I we're going to practice the virtues. Well, hang on. Doing that's quite difficult. <laughs> it's quite hard. Right. So what we're doing is working towards an understanding of the virtues and how to practice them. So the, right. the, the, the practicing stoic isn't isn't wham, you know, virtuous, courageous, just you no, know, they're work that but that is what they think is important. Rather than yeah. making rather than becoming like Elon Musk, whatever, you know. Making there's a um Billion, billion. If there were a rule, is um is virtue is the only good? Would that be the rule? If we had one rule? Well, yes, that's right. But it's it's so general as to be quite useless, isn't it? Well, not quite useless, but it, it, no, I mean it isn't quite useless. But but yeah, yeah. To the extent that there's a rule, it, it, or not, it's not prescriptive, right? <laughs> it's not prescriptive. No. Yeah. Um, it's not. It's not. No. It's not prescriptive. Yeah. Okay. So the four the roles. Tap, we're going to ask a question inside the breakout rooms about the roles. Recap that for us. And this question that came up is, do you see that as a hierarchy? Is one subordinate to the other? Um, yes. Yes, they are subordinate. The most important thing is to fulfill the, your human nature at its best. Okay. So if you if you're trying to do something, and you can't see it as a way of realizing human nature at its best. Um, there's something, there's a problem there. So if it, if it doesn't, for instance, have, you know, if it, if you can't think of it as combining rationality and, and sociability, um, then there's a problem. Um, so the 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 first role, the first person, the first role is the most important, but also. You know, since we're all different people, we need to do things in different way. So if people often ask, so so people say, well, say, here's an example. I want to work for the environment. I think the environment is very important. We should work for it. Um, but I don't want to go out and protest. And and then I, I say, well, you've got to think about the, the way in which you, as a specific person, might want to put that that mission, that mission into practice. And it might not be for you. You you may not be someone who goes out on in the roads and, and demonstrates. You might be someone who talks to their family. You might be someone who who changes their own life and and affects the lives of other people. That's the way in which you you might do things. So that's we each need to think about the specific ways in which we're going to do things. A lot of people are worried about Palestine at the moment, and some people are going out protesting, but other people are not doing that. They're talking to their friends and neighbors and saying, I wish I understood this problem in a different way. So we all have our own specific ways of doing things best that suit us. And of course, you've got to sit, sit, you've got to locate them in your own situation, wherever that is, and 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 think about what you are trying to do with your life. So that's what I mean. It's really so I think the four the four roles can be a really helpful way of kind of anchoring what might otherwise seem. A very general and overgeneralized kind of um, uh, framework. Okay, and so if you were putting those in just four words, and I, I don't know, I, of course, I can't see your screen. So is it universal, <laughs> individual, situational, and then self-chosen roles? Is that the kind of way yeah, you saw yeah, that? Good thing. Thanks, Phil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I could. I'm an academic. Too many words. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 but I was just trying to tighten right, it right. because we're going to no, ask no, a question. Good. That's about good. It. That's good. That's good. The universal, individual, uh, social, uh, contextual. What was your fourth? Um, self, self chosen. Yeah, yeah, that's good. How about that? There's a, there's a list there. Um, yeah, that's a good list. Okay, but that's just kind of the way. So in these things, as we think about what our roles in these spaces, this is kind of how we're figuring out where how we're going through the world, and we're taking this, of course, with the four virtues. We're trying to figure out what where exactly. am I in this moment, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Okay, okay. and so and remember, yeah, and, and remember the virtues are aspiration, aspirational. So they're not the kind of. Uh, uh, how you know it's not not uh, how to grab me you know it's it's it, it's it's something you're working towards right right 
so this, I'm going to paste, and by the way, we're not asking the audience to answer this question here right now. I'm going to stick this inside the chat. This is the first chat, or first question we gave that we're going to put people into breakout rooms with. So I'm just going to get them to consider this first. So I'm typing it here. And this was your uh, question. Uh, do you find the Stoic theory of four roles, which you explained, helpful as a guide to ethical decision making? Um, what do you, what do people, you said you gave this set of questions to a group in London. How, yes. What kind of things are they pondering there? They were pondering, one person was thinking of changing her, her career. So she was, as it were, she, she was um, using this as a, as a way of thinking about role D. She was thinking of changing from property, uh, being a property developer to working for a charity. And we talk, and, and together we talked through that. Um, in an interesting way, I think, yeah. Um, and actually, I think she might have changed her mind in the course of the discussion and thought it might be that she could, that she could perhaps do more good in being uh, um, a caring and helpful property developer. But, but um, yeah, that's just one example. Hmm. Yeah. So that, that's, yeah, so that, that would be one. Yeah, I, um, of course, it all depends on which phase of your life. If you have a lot of young people, they, they're choosing their, their career. They're often choosing their, their life partner, too. If you're a bit older, you might be thinking of how you're going to what you're going to do in retirement. What, what, what's what's what, what's worth doing in retirement? Um, or you might think, well, I'm I'm not, you know, I'm fed up with being in California. I want to go somewhere else. Why, why, you know, there might be all sorts of I, I think it, and there might all sorts of decisions that might be important now. Well, they might be quite small decisions. Right. <laughs> Don't we all end up in the Peloponnese when we're done? That's where we want to all. <laughs> <laughs> we want to be somewhere on the islands. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I think that's what it is. Um, okay. So let me um, thank you, Chris, by the way. Let's let everybody, it's completely okay to give Chris a round of applause to thank him for this presentation. And we're going to go into discussion. He's not going anywhere, but it's okay to say thank you now. I'll say bye. Um, all right. So let's, let me ask you, the folks in the room, or the folks who were off in the, our breakout rooms, you could... Um, you could see, you could hear, you got to talk to each other. Just give me a thumbs up and let me know that this kind of worked or nodding is all that kind of good. Um, had some good discussions, I hope. Um, maybe someone could talk to us about things they heard in the room or some of the conversations or how they approached this question. All right, I see Dennis has got his hand up. So anybody else want to talk to us or tell us about questions or things they heard in the room? Give us a little bit of a report out. Talk to us about what you talked about in your room, or maybe you got to meet some other folks. I see William Stevens has a hand up. Maybe there'll be a couple others here that we'll get to talk to as well. Hi, Phil, and hi, Chris. Uh, yeah, one thing um, we we discussed briefly was um, comparing Cicero's four personae theory with Epictetus's very robust role theory um, in terms of uh, social relations specifically, right, as a, a daughter, a mother, a sister, a citizen, a fellow traveler, uh, and so forth. Um, given Cicero, uh, the fact that Cicero was not a Stoic, but as as you as you said, Chris was influenced by the Stoics. Um, uh, what do you think about Epictetus's role theory? Isn't it more robust? Isn't it more all? Oh, I did. I did. Cicero, Cicero's discussion is in the context of decorum. And it's kind of gentlemanly propriety, but Epictetus is, is you know, at any walk of life, you're going to have a, a range of roles that that you're born into, some that you select. There's some that are short lived, some last for months or weeks or minutes, others last for decades. So I just wondered what you thought about comparing Epictetus's um, theory of sure. roles with. Cicero. Yes, I'm, thank I'm you not, for that question. Yeah, sorry. Um, I'm not sure that I see them as that different. I mean, both Epictetus and Cicero combine, want to combine the idea of a general human role with, um, with specific roles, specific social roles. So that, 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 that's, and that, that, that's you know, one very important feature. So they both want to do that. Um, so I'm not sure that I see well, 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 why do you think Epictetus is more robust? Um, Cicero is a bit more specific, I suppose, with, with four roles. 
I suppose Epictetus doesn't I, it doesn't really have this idea of role number two that there are there are particular ways in which each of us will say express the virtues. Um, well, he he does in the handbook, right? I mean, he says, you know, if you want to be a wrestler, look at your hips, right? Look at yes, your, your shoulders, yes. right? Yes. And so you yeah. have. I think. I mean, I just think they they they're, they're basically. Uh, using the same same theory, I don't I don't know that I see very different uh, great differences between them. I think they all, uh, but 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 are there, am I missing something? Um, well, I just the the um I, I mean I think they maybe they could be adapted to harmonize. I guess it's it, there's a difference in the packaging and the context. I I think maybe because. With Cicero, I mean, his discussion, his presentation of the four personae theory is in the context of a discussion of decorum. So, so it's very much, I mean, given his own, you know, biography and his station in life, it's a quest for him. It's in the context of this gentlemanly propriety of decorum, right? Where where he's worried about patrons, right? Given his social rank, whereas with Epictetus, right, the ex-slave. Well, you know, he, he's he's been subjected to a very different life experiences, and he's not a member of the nobility, and he's not wealthy, right? And he chides himself for his iron lamp being stolen, right? And, and he replaces it with a clay lamp. So it just seems like, I, I don't know, it, it, it seems like Epictetus is much more relatable in terms of recognizing that everyone's in a different situation with a different set of overlapping uh, roles that they have. And Cicero is like, well, yeah, you can be a landowner. That's an okay profession because then you own the land and you have people work it for you. I mean, it's like, well, yeah, if you own a few farms, that's a, that's a choice of profession that's available to people like Cicero and his buddies, but he's a member of the wealthy elite. Right. And that's not going to be the situation for people like, you know, you and I, who are teachers, right, who are emeritus professors and the other members of this group who are, you know, studying stoicism for a year or two years now. And they have full time jobs and kids and and they have very different kind of socioeconomic stories than a, a member of the nobility like Cicero does. But the 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 four role theory in its you know in in essence is is can be adapted to any given role any given situation. So if you want to take Epictetus, role C, his social situation where he would be a, a you know a poor a poor steric teacher who's only got one lamp or whatever. Um, his 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 main objective would be being a, a steric teacher. Um, he's a human being. And and he has a specific character and inclinations. I don't I don't I don't see. Okay, yes, they are. They they write from a different broad context. Their examples are different. I do agree. Their examples are different. But I think the theory in itself is 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 the same theory in both cases. Um, and I think its 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 applicability is is equally uni universal. And so. But 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 yes, yeah, so that's what I think. Yes. Okay. I agree. Thank you. They, they present that and say thank you for that. And thank you. Bit. I hadn't thought about this being different myself, so I think that's useful. Thank you for that, Jonathan Holland. Yeah, we 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 had an interesting discussion about like our you know framing our different roles as a member of our family, our uh, our role in our jobs, uh, and how to apply the virtues within that context, the role as a as a member of the community and so on, um, and how, you know, looking within our own context and, and and really intentionally asking ourselves, you know, how how can we best apply the virtues in these in these different contexts? And uh I, I saw a few other questions in front of me and I was I was just gonna also add I saw Stoke Dan with a with his hand up, and uh, I, I was just going to put it like I also mentioned in my group. We had a few minutes to kill. Uh, Stoic Dan's group had hosted a discussion on the philosophy of Star Trek uh, a few months ago, uh, and uh, we got into a discussion about the role ethics of Star Trek. And I, I mentioned in today's discussion 
uh, that if, in particular, if you're a Trekkie, uh, Star Trek The Next Generation really embraces the idea of role ethics because they they often, they often talk about how the economics of the future are different. You know, uh, everyone who's a member of the, of the crew is uh, embracing their individual roles uh, 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 very intentionally and and their motivation is to perform their roles the best they can. The best, uh, and and I, I wanted to bring that up. Um, huh. All right. I don't, I don't know if there's a lot of stoicism inside of Star Trek, but I hadn't thought about that whole role thing. Do you ever contemplate this, Chris Gill? No. I'm sorry. I don't know Star Trek very well. Not, not <laughs> much of a Star Trek guy, I guess. I'm afraid okay. not. No, I'm a bit of a... Bit of a yeah. uh, geek, I suppose. <laughs> but uh, some other kind of nerd, right? All right, tell us. Um, um, a different I think... nerd, a different nerd. Yeah, it's not a Star yeah. Trek nerd. I hear. It. I got gotcha. you. So, <laughs> okay, Chris, you've got. We and we're at the time where we want to be thinking about what this second breakout room is about. And so you've given another question. I'm going to put it back inside the chat. The question for the second breakout room. Uh, 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 I'm sorry. And you asked the question. Um, if you found wrongdoing at work and you do you blow the whistle, even if this has damaging consequences for you or your family, or do you just keep quiet and let things lie? What should you do? What would you do? How I'm going to guess you're going to ask the question be about how these roles or how do the virtues apply in this situation, right? Yeah, I think what I'm what the, the way that um, because remember, I'm trying to explain Cicero. So, yeah, I think it's going to be, yeah, and, and uh, it, this it may not be the roles here. We might come back to the roles, but more I'm thinking about the virtues okay. and, and our human nature. Okay, so we might say, well, yes, I, I, I'm, you know, you might say, oh, I'm going to blow the whistle because that's the just thing to do. Um, but then I, I, I want to make this example quite difficult, blowing the whistle. So... Here we have a situation where the, the situation I imagine is, is you, you're going to blow, blow the whistle, but you know the firm is, is corrupt. So people are not probably going to listen to you. So you're going to have to, if you, if you and, and, and they may not like it if you blow the whistle too. The, the, you may get fired. Um, yeah, that's and it's got consequences, right? It's got consequences. Yeah, yeah. And, and you, you might be that you'll lose your job. And you might be in a district where it's hard to get another job like that. So it's quite a tough, a tough decision. But you might still say, well, I really I, I can't I can't, con you know, I can't live with this. I can't I can't contemplate this injustice going on. Yeah. So I'm hoping that people will refer to the virtues and perhaps what a good human life involves. And uh, and also think about the the other factors I mentioned at the beginning, like the the advantages, what are the advantages in life? How are we going to fit those in? And our duties, because you might say, well, I've got duties to my family. These these override others, other duties. So I'm yeah. trying to get people to bring together all the things that I've talked about in this, the session, the advantages, duties, virtues, and what it is to lead a good human life. And maybe the four persona theory, a four role theory too, because you might yeah. say, I, my, well, let me tell you, one of the things I yeah, think about um, in this, Chris, is that what always comes up, you know, or a place where I see it, there's a tension between uh, looking at a thing and saying, well, that's beyond my control. How can I just say this is beyond my control? And, you know, can I just put away? But of course, that isn't me necessarily acting with courage or acting with justice for others. I mean, I'm not leaning into it. But those I am as a stoic trying to figure out how to balance all those things out to come to that virtue right human excellence kind of a moment um, but in this situation you can't not make a decision okay so you've got to make it it's within your control to make one one of the two decisions either you blow the whistle or you don't so this right. is i'm setting this up as something where you have to make i found this in the discussion i did before everyone was everyone was trying to look at look for a way out you know oh, there must right. be another third way there isn't a third way Either you blow the whistle or you don't. Yeah. Okay. Well, That's all right. And nobody, by the way, for all the Star Trek fans, there's no Kobayashi Maru ex uh, exit in this one, right? So you can't just pull a third 
out of it. That Chris is not letting you do that. So you have to make a decision about whether you blow the whistle or not, right? And how do you do it? And how do you, you know, what are the things that you're going to balance to make that work? And, and sometimes you might think, well, I, I know I should, but I wouldn't. I mean, you know, so there might be a different reply, different answers. That's why I've sure, said sure. Yeah. I think we're all back. Let's see. Are you going to blow the whistle or not? What did you come up with? Yes, no? Put that in the chat. Maybe raise a couple of hands and talk to us about issues that came up inside your room. Let me start, by the way. I'm just going to ask Brittany, because she's already at the top of my screen, to unmute and uh, talk to us about this whistleblowing thing. Okay. I do have a bit of background noise here, but yeah, this is really challenging. Um, I mean, in a lot of cases, I think the obvious choice is to say, yes, you're going to blow the whistle. There might be a few cases where, depending on the factors at stake here, you might decide not to. But um, our group had a really good discussion about, you know, you want to stay true to yourself. And of course, virtue means doing the right thing, no matter what the consequences might be to your preferred indifference. So I think this is where thinking about indifference preferred versus dispreferred can really come into play you know what do you you might gain virtue you might lose your job your financial security um but yeah it's just a matter of making a good judgment based on what you believe to be the right thing for that situation yeah you know like chris had pointed out earlier there's no 10 commandment you know there's not this rubric for everything you have to figure out how these values fit and make mm -hmm. these judgments right mm -hmm. exactly yeah, super. Chris, you can jump in on this if you want, or did I just get this right? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm just just interested. Um, yeah, I think it's it's interesting. Did you have Brittany people who who would have said no? I wouldn't blow. The, I wouldn't or, or blow the whistle. And in when I had a discussion of this before, a, a lot of, the majority of people said, "Well, I think the right thing to do is to blow the whistle." And then I asked them, well, would you do it? Would you blow the whistle? And a minority of people said they would actually blow the whistle because of the consequences, the harm. So it's it's a difficult, it's not easy, this decision. Yeah, absolutely, it's not easy. I think everyone in our room said they would blow the whistle and a couple of people shared experiences that they'd had where they had been in a similar situation. Right. Um, and so that's, it's always wonderful to hear about real life situations. Yes. And one, I'm not sure if he wants me to share his information, so I won't name his name, but he was talking about, he made a decision, um, you know, 30 years ago when his company was taken over by another company that had questionable ethics and he made a decision to leave. And the way he described it, it was the best decision of his life. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. So Kevin, is it okay? <laughs> I see him in the nice. chat. So, so it was Kevin. Um, yeah. So it was really great to have, you know, a real life feedback about that, that yes, this actually does work staying true to yourself and, and your virtuous character. No. And, and I think again, if you're, if you're, if you ever end up working inside of any complicated company at all, you could really come up to figuring out, okay, I have to make an ethics decision. And we, you know, I do a lot of work with it people and, mm -hmm. you know, we typically have control of lots of stuff, right? I mean, you know, because we're controlling computer systems and we get asked for data and some of this is legal and some of it's not. Mm -hmm. And I just think that's a, it is a real, it, it is a real issue. And I myself have been in that space where someone asked me to do something. I said, I think that's illegal. <laughs> yeah. All right. I got a couple more hands. Let's see what we can get done here. We're going to, we'll get to Dan. And by the way, we'll, we're going to do something, but let's get to Dan first. All right, Dan, get you to unmute. The quick story I told in my breakout room is sometimes there is a third option besides staying quiet or being the whistleblower, doing something uh, uh, to stop something uh, actively is um, I, uh, my story is uh, in 2019 at the end of Stoicon, I was in a little bookstore in Athens, Greece, and John Sellers was doing a book launch. And one person in the audience took the mic and basically took over the meeting. He was talking about all his ideas and information, and he wouldn't give up the mic. And the, the book launch was stopped. And, you know, we could have just sat there and, and, and uh, suffered, uh, or we could have grabbed the mic away from him. But what I did is I leaned over and I asked for the mic to ask my question 
And he was so astonished and he gave me the mic and then the whole situation was over. And I asked John Sellers about his book and the book launch went on as normal. And uh, I always remember that is sometimes there's a simple answer, uh, a simple solution, but you have to look for the opportunity. Yeah, mm -hmm. I get it. All right, thank you for that, Dan. All right, let me tell you what. So we are at um, 1127, right? And we say that we're always gonna get you in here and out of here in an hour and a half but we never do. So here's what we're actually going to do. First off, anybody who said that you, you know, look, Phil, I'm here for an hour, hour and a half. I said, I'm going to do this last little thing. And then it's completely okay for you guys to go. But if you got any sort of additional questions, we can hang around for a few minutes. I'm hoping that Chris is not in a giant hurry, but maybe we get another 15 minutes of questions or something like that. I think if you want to do it, the thing that we always do here at the bottom of the hour before we get gone is we thank the speaker. And the way I do that is I let everybody unmute and say thank you to Chris Gill. And this is what we're going to do. So I just pressed the button. I'm going to count you down and we're all going to say thank you to Chris for showing up and helping us out today. Ready? Three, two, one. Thank, thank you, you, Chris. 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 Oh, Appreciate it, Chad. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, you Phil. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Chris. That was brilliant.